Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Broer Saxberg. Hello. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at Kaplan, and at Kaplan, we focus a lot of time and attention on how to improve the learning outcomes of our students and also how we measure learning outcomes. One of the key things that we're looking for in the future as we work to do this work at scale, learning engineering if you will, are new innovations. An area that promises to have a lot of innovations uh, coming up is cognitive neuroscience. And one of the best proponents of the intersection between cognitive neuroscience and education technology is our next speaker. Adam Ghazali. He is a professor in neurology, physiology, and psychiatry at UC San Francisco, and he's founded a number of companies, uh, including Neuroscape, which does uh, uh, novel brain assessments work driven off of translational neuroscience work, um, also uh, Achille Interactive Labs, a company that creates therapeutic video games for students, again, grounded on cognitive neuroscience ideas. And he's the co-founder and chief scientist at Jazz Venture Partners, which is a venture capital firm focused on uh, improving human performance. He's a scientific advisor for many companies, including Apple and GE. He's authored more than 100 papers. He's given hundreds of presentations. Um, he wrote and hosted a PBS special called The Distracted Mind with Dr. Adam Ghazali and co-authored a book with Larry Rosen called The Distracted Mind, Ancient Brains in a High-Tech World. Dr. Ghazali has won many different awards. His most recent award, appropriately enough, is the 2015 Society for Neuroscience Science Educator Award. Please welcome Dr. Adam Ghazali. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here and uh, honored to be your lunchtime entertainment today. Uh, I'm going to give you both uh, a story about what's happening today, and then uh, a look about really into tomorrow. And I want to start in this domain. It's doesn't, it might not be an expected introduction, but really talking about human performance and the fact that us humans, especially modern humans, have really always been consumed with this notion of high-level performance. And in this world, the world of physical fitness, there's been an obsession really for optimal performance, whether it's strength, endurance, power, speed, flexibility, balance, coordination, there are specialized equipment, practitioners, programs, all devoted to optimizing these abilities. Really begging the question, what are we doing to optimize these abilities, the core functions of the human brain? Really, what most makes us human? Our memory, attention, perception, decision-making, emotional regulation, and at the highest level, things like wisdom and compassion. I would say in this regard, we're just tragically lacking. So when it comes to improving these abilities in young minds, I would say that should fall into the domain of education. But as you know, we've seen a, a largely siloed approach to the transformation of information content, but not the building of the underlying information systems, processing systems that it depends upon. In my world, I'm a neurologist, uh, in the world of clinical care, neurology and psychiatry, we've seen similar uh, challenges of a siloed approach to using small molecules to improve cognition and emotional regulation. I feel like we can do a lot better, and I just want to pause for a moment and talk about some of the current challenges, ones that I know many of you are familiar with, but I'm going to give it to you from my perspective, especially coming into this as a neuroscientist. The first is that we don't have assessments out there readily to not just determine how well a young person is learning the material they're presented with, but how their brains and minds are working. How does those underlying processing abilities uh, develop, and how do they map on to other aspects of education? But that doesn't prevent us from treating, of course. But the problem is, is that our education system is not targeting these core underlying information processing abilities. And that leads to a disconnect be between what we think of as education and what we think of as neuroscience and improving and enhancing cognition. As you know, we have very non-personalized systems, so we're not directing the training and the improving of these abilities to individual young brains. Many practitioners view the classic, you know, traditional didactic approach 
in a silo, a unimodal approach to think that that is the only way that we can work to improve uh, young minds. And then the biggest problem is that we have an open loop system. We have a disconnect between how we intervene to improve the function of the brain, how we assess it, and then how we reapply that intervention. And I'm gonna come back to that again, but just to put it together, these are what I view as the major challenges that we face, not just in education, but also our mental health care system of improving cognition and people that have deficits. We need targeted, personalized, multimodal, and closed loop treatments. Begging the question of technology. Right? And I know that this is a very technologically forward-looking audience, so you're aware of all the amazing tools that are being developed. Many of you are creating them, investing in them, uh, using them yourselves. But as you know, we're really standing at the level of a, a phase shift right now with consumer-available virtual reality, augmented reality, motion capture, wearable physiological devices, and artificial intelligence and other machine learning algorithms. We know that most of this, probably 90% of it, is really targeting entertainment, media, and communication. But if these could be tools to improve the function of the brain, both as an alternative or a parallel approach to education, as well as a clinical approach to medicine, we can really make a big difference. So people often ask, how can we think about these tools in that way? How can they really hit such a high-level goal? On the surface, it's not really that complicated. It's because with this technology, we could create very powerful, targeted experiences. And experiences are the gateway to our brain's plasticity. This is really a non-controversial point. It's the entire basis of learning and the brain. We know very well how strong this relationship is between experience and plasticity. You could witness a single tragic event and have a detrimental impact on the functioning of your brain for the rest of your life. Right? We call that post-traumatic stress disorder. So our challenge now is how do we create technology or leverage existing technologies to maximally harness the brain's plasticity through experience to improve cognition? I would say that the best chance we have of doing that is through the creation of a closed loop system, the opposite of really what we do now. So a closed loop, just to be perfectly clear about it, this is sort of my most important point, is where we intervene in any way uh, that you're trying to target and then you record the impact as rapidly as possible. So ideally, with no latency, in real time, you're intervening, recording, and then using that data to update and refine your intervention, applying it again, recording, updating, applying. Cycling over and over again, refining at each pass, becoming more targeted and more personalized. There's many ways to create closed loop systems. The way that we've really latched onto over the last uh, eight years or so is through video games. Now, some of you might be thinking, and this is a, once a popular notion of thinking about video games, that they're just another manifestation of human mania, our enduring quality of going relentlessly after absolutely pointless goals. So this Time Magazine, 1982, granted the early day of video games, but even consumer-level video games like these, the most controversial of all video games due to their high violence content, the first-person shooters, have been shown to have benefits on cognitive control abilities, attention, uh, working memory, task switching, in the young people that play them, whether you compare them to other uh, people that don't play video games, or even taking naive young people and having them play these games, you see these effects. So even in the consumer games that are really directed to entertainment, there seems to be something there that maybe we could harness. So how do we create a closed loop video game? So here's just a little cartoon of how we do that. You're playing a game, and of course, it's your brain controlling your body to play the game. That leads to performance metrics, which could be recorded by the game engine in real time. How fast you are, how accurate you are, and other more complex aspects of your behavior. This can then be used to update the environment, to scale the challenge that a person is playing based upon their ability in that moment. We can also use the closed loop to give feedback, real-time feedback about how you're doing and rewards. Every game developer knows this is how you build deep immersion in gameplay through that type of system, which in essence is a closed loop itself. And then we could take new technology and go one step further. We could use motion capture, right? You could even the connect on a gaming system you could buy online. Physiological recordings. Many people are wearing watches and other tools to record their physiology, but it's almost completely unactionable. Here you could feed all this data into the game engine in real time, so now the software is more um, deeply processing what is going on with you in the moment, so it understands you in a deeper way. 
And then we could use tools like augmented and virtual reality to create even more real world, more engaging, immersive experiences. We could wrap all of this together with AI and other machine learning algorithms. So what we wind up with here is a truly integrated multimodal closed loop system. And I believe strongly that in different versions, this is the future of using technology to create these powerful targeted and adaptive tools to help improve brain function for people that are healthy and people that are impaired. So let's make it a little abstract now and I'll tell you my first foray into this. It was in 2008, I've been a cognitive neuroscientist at that point for 15 years studying aging. So my first example is about the aging brain, not the young brain. And I had this uh, goal of trying to improve attention abilities in older adults, because we've been studying the impairment as people get older. And I'm not talking about dementia and Alzheimer's disease, but just healthy aging. And so we built this game with friends of mine that worked at LucasArts, and the game is called NeuroRacer, and it uses two closed-loop algorithms to challenge participants in uh, two competing tasks. So what you do when you play NeuroRacer is you drive a car on a road like this, going left or right, up the hill, down the hill, depending on the road turning, and then you have to respond as accurately and as rapidly as you can to these target signs that come up. So a green circle, like you see here, but not red circles, not green pentagons, which are quite hard not to press to. And so that's NeuroRacer. So you have these two parallel adaptive algorithms that are driving your performance across domains. Now, if you were to play this, you would, without even being aware of it, just trade off between these two, because it's very hard to multitask in this game. But we learn that everyone, including 80-year-olds, like to level up in video games. It's just some innate part of being a human being. So what we do is we tether across the two tasks with the reward cycle. You don't level up in the game unless both tasks get better. And then we did a three-year study after a year of game development. I'm just going to show you a snapshot of some data. The red line means that you multitask perfectly. And at least in San Francisco, the 20-year-olds there believe that they are multitasking masters. And they will suffer no decrement when they do these two tasks versus doing one of them. But what we see is a 27% drop in performance. Now, we already know that older adults suffer in these type of multitasking challenges. But what happens in between? Do you just retain this ability your whole life and then just plummet in one tragic year when you're 79? No, we see that you just plummet every tragic year of your life, just like this. <laughs> and so that's what the curve looks like. You have one small like year peak, probably when you're 23, and then just a lifetime of decline in this ability and others related to very rapid cognitive control. But after a group of older adults, healthy older adults, trained for one month on the adaptive version of the game, we showed that we can improve their ability to multitask on the game beyond that, or in many cases equal to that, of 20-year-olds. But most importantly, we confirmed our hypothesis, and we showed that we can improve their attention and their working memory abilities on different tasks than those they were trained in. Using neural recordings during gameplay, we're able to show that this was mechanistically driven by improvements in the prefrontal cortex and its network with the rest of the brain. We published this at the end of 2013. It was the cover of this journal, Nature, really helping us step into this domain of using something that sits firmly in the entertainment domain as a serious tool to help improve cognition. And two pathways happened since then. I'm going to tell you just a quick snapshot of both of them. The first was that I realized I did not want this to end as an academic exercise, even a paper as exciting as one in nature. And so I helped co-found a company you heard mentioned called Achille Interactive. Um, it's based in Boston and San Francisco. A lot of those uh, high-end uh, game folks from LucasArts are, are on our team now. And Achille is doing something quite interesting. There is no consumer products. There's no marketing. There's nothing being sold. There's no revenue right now. Achille is taking the uh, IP behind NeuroRacer, built a much higher level game. If you want young people to really enjoy video games and you don't have violence in it, you really need to bring on high levels of art, music, and story. The same thing you need to do with older adults and, and women and girls, other populations besides young boys and video games. And so we did that. We have a high level team. We created these games. And now they're going through full rigorous regulatory approval and testing as diagnostic and therapeutic video games. I'm not going to have time to go through all of this, but all of these studies are being uh, done right now to see can they really have an impact across diverse populations that suffer attention impairments. What I think is most relevant to this audience is our trial on ADHD, which is now a phase three FDA trial, will complete and read out this year, 
to have that game EVO approved as the first non-drug treatment for ADHD and the first prescribable video game for children with ADHD. So it will be an interesting year. Thank you. We have autism, depression, and mild cognitive impairment studies on the, on the way to phase three trials as well. So it'll be very interesting from the point of view of who's paying for this, who's prescribing it, um, even once we hit that regulatory hurdle. So that will, I think, really change the dynamics, especially because many children in classrooms are diagnosed with ADHD. So this is a real intersection, in my mind, between mental health and what we think of as education. Okay, I'm just gonna quickly tell you what we're doing back in my lab. I'm a professor at UCSF, and that Nature paper and the birth of Achille really changed us dramatically. We became a center called Neuroscape. You could uh, check out our new website, uh, neuroscape.ucsf.edu, and you'll see a lot more than I'm gonna, a lot more detail than I have time to share with you now. But our goal is to really bridge this gap between technology and neuroscience to create tools to improve how brains function. And I, as I keep mentioning, we have a very large clinical program, but in parallel to that, we have an education program that we're just as excited about. Let me just tell you about some of the new technology that we're working on. First, here's a view of our new neuroscience building at UCSF, and this is what our latest lab looks like. These are called Neuroscape Research Labs. We have three of them. You can see they look like an interactive media lab you might find at a game company, but these are research facilities. We have uh, the control room on the left sitting across the wall from an experimental lab where our participants come in and they engage in interactive challenges that we create for them. While they're doing that, we're recorded recording pretty much everything we can in real time, from their heart rate, their galvanic skin response, emotional uh, responsivity, their eye movements, even recording brain activity during gameplay to understand how these challenges change the brain and their entire physiology. Let's talk a little about the technology we favor. Of course, mobile and wireless, right? The accessibility of it makes it so exciting, and not just the devices like tablets and phones that deliver it, but also physiological recordings like mobile EG caps that are just starting to reach that level that we're having confidence in the robustness and sensitivity of them out in the field, in classrooms, in people's homes, to understand the brain in the real world. Here's a shot from a study that we are just completing now in India, foster care children playing a game of ours. This game's called Medi Meditrain. It's a meditation-inspired game to help improve attention abilities. The accessibility of mobile devices uh, around the world to places that we have trouble getting doctors and teachers is just incredibly exciting. Um, also on the uh, mobile side, we have developed an app called ACE. It stands for Adaptive Cognitive Evaluation. And what we did here was take the algorithms that we use in gameplay and just brought them into a very rapid uh, sampling tool of the different cognitive control abilities that we're interested in. So from working memory, selective attention, sustained attention, task switching, multitasking, can all be sampled really rapidly on an app. And this gives us some really exciting potential one of which is to get them into classrooms. So Melina Unkafer is the director of our education program. We launched a study at the end of 2016 with support from the NSF to put ACE in classrooms to sample these cognitive control abilities through a unique assessment and see how they map on to standard academic performance metrics like reading and math we just still don't actually understand the connection between them, which is sort of remarkable to think about the disconnect between neuroscience and education. Then once we understand them, can have a cognitive profile for each child, how do we use that in an actionable way through games that maybe they'll play at home or maybe in gym class? Uh, I'll show you some of our physical fitness games to help improve those abilities, to level the playing field so that everyone can maximally reach their potential. Virtual reality, motion capture. It's already part of the world of gaming. It will just continue to expand and inevitably become part of what we think of as education and medicine. We would like to get out in front of that and not just respond reactively 10 years in the future when uh, it's already moved on. So now I'm just gonna give you a quick sneak peek of six games that we've developed over the last three years. So since NeuroRacer, Body Brain Trainer is a game that engages both physical and cognitive fitness. Engage is a game for children to help them build sustained attention um, and also delay rewards, something that I think is very important for all of us, especially our young people. Rhythmicity is a game that's designed to help make you more rhythmic to improve anticipation and timing in the brain. Virtual Attention and Labyrinth are two virtual reality games, one focused on attention, one on memory. And Metatrain is the meditation-inspired game that I mentioned before. All of them involve high-level 
game team, so that this is like sort of our, our main lesson from NeuroRacer. Games need to be engaging and fun. They can't just be you know, sort of superficial exercise that you just touch lightly. Just like physical fitness, you need to really have people engage deeply in the training. And so art, music, and story is a big part of all of these as well as reward cycles. And then they all use different type of inputs from motion capture, Body Brain Trainer records your heart rate during gameplay. So while you're playing Body Brain Trainer, your cognitive challenge is being scaled to your ability, right? Your attention, how you're making memory decisions. What we're also doing with your heart rate is scaling the level of physical challenge. So before you play BBT, which you could see in the top panel, you get a VO2 max, and we figure out where, you're, where you should be targeted, right at your anaerobic threshold. And so while you're playing the game, which is all in motion capture, if your heart rate is below that, the game senses that in real time through a closed loop and automatically increases the amplitude of your movements, driving your heart rate up. If your heart rate goes too high, the game knows that and it titrates it back. The idea here is that by bringing together physical and cognitive challenges, we think we'll have a greater improvement on cognitive abilities than if you play this game sitting down, just engaged with your eyeballs and your fingers on an iPad. And so that could be a really important principle of education that we would be very excited to get into the classroom. Likewise, what you could see here is, is the use of VR as well as an omnidirectional treadmill on your left to be able to navigate in a 3D world to train your memory system. We think that as exciting as all of these are independently, and we've spent years developing them, and we will spend years testing them before anyone sees them, the real win is bringing them together, what I call neuro CrossFit training. Right? We don't want to travel in those same paths, especially of the pharmaceutical industry, of creating these thick silos around every single drug. What you should be getting is a personalized uh, prescription whether it be educationally directed or medically directed, of games that are targeting you as an individual, how you present it on day one, and then have them progress and change with you over time. I just want to conclude with our look into the future. Right now we're developing new technology we've been working on for years called the glass brain. What you're looking at here is my glass brain. So it's a combination of MRI, you could see the surface of the brain in blue, the cortical fibers connecting the different brain areas in gold, and overlaid on top, integrated in real time, is EEG recording showing different frequencies of, that were being generated by neural activity in my brain while I was engaged in gameplay. So what can we do with this? This is still a proof of concept, but something we are very excited about. It's a data visualization tool. Well, the first thing, we could look at what it means to have real-time neural diagnostics. We have a virtual reality version of this, and I can tell you it's quite a surreal experience to put on EG cap and then a VR head mount display and fly through your own brain, watching your own brain. It's very meta. Um, and so what can we do with like a therapist or a teacher looking at another brain and seeing how it responds to a challenge? But ultimately, we think that this will be the highest level of closing the loop. That if a person is playing a game, let's say it's a young person engaged in a game that's trying to improve their sustained attention ability, something we all know we need more of, the game can record where are the vulnerabilities and how their brain is processing that challenge. Maybe it's visual, maybe it's attentional, maybe it's motoric, and then adjust the challenge and the rewards to the processing signals, not just to the end product, which is the performance. We think this will be like a gamma knife focusing the game engine to optimize those abilities that most need to be improved. So we're very excited to see how this technology can integrate together and mostly uh, to get it out into the world, which is why I'm excited uh, to speak to folks like you that really help with that translation from an academic center like ours into uh, people's lives. And with that, I'd like to just thank you for your attention. And Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sarah Allen. In education, it can be easy to get distracted at times by the latest shiny objects, the things that attract a lot of buzz and attention for their potential to impact kids, but often ultimately disappoint us. So our next speaker represents the total antithesis of that. Over the past 15 years, she's built some of the most effective high schools in the country, if not the world, by doing the hard work of driving real innovation in the way schools function, impacting real teachers, real kids, 
in the thousands and soon to be tens of thousands. Diane Tavener, CEO and co-founder of Summit Public Schools, has led her organization to focus relentlessly on what matters for students and to never stop iterating in, as they improve their model. And now Summit is modeling for our whole sector what collaboration across charters and district schools can look like through the sharing of Summit's platform and tools and practices through the Basecamp initiative. And this is really expanding our collective sense of what's really possible in education at scale. Summit and Diane get a lot of attention, but that's because their impact is real and it's growing every day. Please welcome Diane Tavener, the CEO of Summit Public Schools. It's um, really a pleasure to be here today. When I was in third grade, um, my teacher called me out of the room one day, said she wanted to talk with me. And, um, you know, when you're a third grader, adults look very tall and big and they loom large. And I remember her standing there with arms crossed, looking down at me and saying, Diane, you're really unfocused, you're not paying attention. You're lazy, you're not doing your work, and you're not clean. And I'm talking to you because if you don't change your behaviors, your future isn't very bright. And what my teacher didn't know that day was that there had been another fight at home that week. And this one was bad, and my mom was hurt, and the police had taken my dad. And pretty much all I could think about is what would happen when he got back. And in fact, I was so worried about that I hadn't bathed because I didn't want to get caught in a vulnerable position. What I didn't have that day was a voice. I couldn't tell her my story. I couldn't ask for help. And I didn't have the power to change my circumstances. Statistically speaking, I shouldn't be standing here today. I became a teacher because I wanted to help kids like me. I thought that I could get to know them and their stories, that I'd be able to help change their circumstances and defend them when they needed defending. But what I learned very quickly is with 35 students coming through a room in 50 minute intervals, it's nearly impossible to get to know them. And the few who I did know their stories, the help that I could give seemed fleeting. And most often it wasn't even what they wanted because they wanted the same thing that I had wanted as a third grader. They wanted their own voice. And they wanted to be empowered to change their own circumstances and control their own lives. And so what I learned pretty quickly was that teachers aren't set up for success. And schools aren't designed to empower people. And so like many people who are at the start of their education career, I started making plans to leave the profession. And that's when I got a call. By then, my dad had moved on, divorced my mom, and remarried. And what I learned in that call is that he had killed his second wife. She was five years older than me. Her name was Lori. She was a high school dropout. I went back to teaching with a renewed sense of purpose and a commitment that I carry with me every single day. This is a hard story. It was a hard story to live, it's a hard story to tell, and I know it's a hard story to listen to. And so I tell it because all of us who want to change education, every single one of us, if we don't know exactly why we want to change it, if we don't know exactly what the purpose of education is, we have absolutely no chance of getting the how right. I ask myself three questions every single day. Is this the school that I would want to teach in? 
is this the school that I wish I could have gone to? And is this the school that I would have sent my own child to? And those are the three questions I asked myself when I started Summit Public Schools 15 years ago. We launched with a vision for that we could equip every single student to live the life they want to live, to live a good life, to live a life that's filled with purpose, that is um, filled with relationships that are strong, with engagement in the community, that they could live a life that was healthy and that they could be financially stable and secure. Today, that vision is real. In 11 schools in two states, Washington and California, we serve over 3,000 incredibly diverse students. Summit ranks among the best schools in the nation. We've won design challenges like XQ and been named by Fast Company as one of the most innovative companies in the world, which I always find funny because we're not even a company. Because we have designed our schools to ensure that every single student leaves equipped for the life that they want to live, 98% of our graduates are accepted to at least one four-year college. And they finish college at a rate that is two times the national average. So how do we do this? How do we go about creating schools that get these kinds of results? We start by thinking about and understanding what students who are leaving us and going into adulthood need. What do they need to be equipped to take advantage of an opportunity to live the life that they want to live. I want to introduce you to one of our students who attends uh, Summit Prep in Redwood City. His name is Edgar, and so let's meet Edgar. My name is Edgar Anaya, and I'm currently a junior at Summit Prep in Redwood City. I just turned 17 in April. I would say my family's a little bit complicated. My mom had me at 16, so it was like really hard for her. Her and my dad weren't like always connected when I was young. My parents got divorced when I was about five or six, and so it was pretty hard growing up. Before Summit, I went to school at like a regular middle school. There was a lot of older people that were like abusing drugs, and there was like a lot of people that were in gangs. It wasn't a place where I could really thrive. And so my aunts and my uncles have actually been to Summit. All these people around me that were family, they were thriving at Summit. And so my mom wanted the same for me. I feel like at Summit, even on the first day, like a lot of people care about you there. Everyone's a little bit more connected. So what does it take to create schools that help kids like Edgar realize their dreams and kids, millions of other kids who are like him in many ways and very different from him and others? Well, it takes four things. First, we have to believe that students are capable of so much more than we've been led to believe they're capable of. We have to um, equip teachers with the skills that they need. We have to design great schools, and we have to give people the tools to do the job that we need them to do. Our students are capable of so much, and yet we don't ask them to live up to that capability. We need to broaden the outcomes that we expect from students and that we expect our schools to equip them with. The good news is we have an abundance of science today that tells us exactly what those skills are and what they need. And so Summit, based on the science that we have incredible access to through amazing partnerships with some of the most phenomenal scientists in the country, have worked on developing the four outcomes that all students need to achieve by the time they leave us and go into the world. Those outcomes begin with a set of skills, broad skills that are life 
time skills that get applied in multiple contexts. Let me give you an example of some of those skills. We're talking about um, knowing enough about something to be able to make a claim, to back that claim with evidence, and then to be able to um, make an argument around that claim. We're talking about the ability to know something so well that you can make a hypothesis, that you can design an experiment around that hypothesis, gather the data, interpret it, and draw a conclusion from that. Real skills that real people use in real work every single day. But you can't just do skills in a vacuum. And so in order to hypothesize and analyze, kids actually need to know some stuff. In fact, they need to have knowledge about a broad set of content. And so we need to ensure that our kids are um, learning a whole broad set of content, but more importantly, that they're learning the skills to learn for the rest of their lives. Because no matter how much they learn and how, no matter how much they apply it while they're with us, they'll never know everything they need to know for the rest of their lives. The third thing they need is a set of habits that they can deploy in their life. And um, we draw inspiration from um, what employers actually need and what they're asking for from their workers. The top three things employers are looking for are the ability to work collaboratively, the ability to make good decisions, and um, the ability to... I've forgotten what it is right now. Let me see. Um, work on teams. Um, so what do you, how do you develop those skills? How do you practice those skills as adults? You have to build them as habits. And you build habits by practicing them every single day in an environment that provides a lot of rich feedback and that is a safe environment. And so our students work in groups constantly. They learn to manage complex relationships with diverse people and to um, put their knowledge to work in complex tasks. And the final thing that our students need when they leave us is to have a sense of purpose. Purpose starts with the ability to explore a whole bunch of different interests, the ability to go deeper and dive into those interests and find what sticks. Purpose comes about when people have the opportunity to examine their values and think about what they care about and what matters to them and develop this self-knowledge and then put it to use to create a vision for themselves for the future. And then, of course, we need to help everyone develop a credible path towards that vision. And I believe, as a K-12 education system, we need to ensure that when every single student leaves us, that they take that first credible step on that pathway they've designed for themselves. These are the four things that students need to leave us with if they're gonna be set up for success. And so to make that happen, we need to equip our teachers to create and curate the environments and the experiences that will enable our students to develop all these skills and these habits and this learning. This doesn't happen easily. Teaching is a really tough job, and it doesn't happen overnight that you develop the skill set that we're talking about. And that's why Summit teachers spend 40 to 50 days a year, every single year, honing their craft and developing their skills. And that's why they are in an environment that is focused on giving them feedback so that they can grow and develop and learn, not so that they can be judged and evaluated. We need to design great schools. Teachers can't do the work that they're doing and need to do in environments that aren't designed to set them up for that success. And so this is the moment where you can really tell the difference between a reformer and a transformer or a tinkerer and an innovator. Because if you're going to design schools that actually do all the things I've just been talking about, they have to look very differently than what most schools look like today. Let me give you just one example of that difference. Today, if you go into most traditional schools, the learning is variable for students, but the time is fixed. 
And this is very familiar to all of us. I'm sure we all have had the experience of a pretty standard cadence in a school where a teacher introduces a unit, there's a series of classroom lectures and activities and homework assignments, and at some point on a given day at a given time, students are tested to see what they've learned, and then they're evaluated, and in the meantime, they've moved on to the next unit. The time is what's fixed. The learning for all those students is variable. In a redesigned school, it is the learning that is fixed and the time that is variable. Students actually learn, they master, they become competent, and the time is not what um, is the determining factor there. But in order for this to happen, they need support and guidance and the ability to develop their skills so they can drive their own learning, and that comes through one-to-one -one mentoring and a really focused effort to make those skills come to life and become a reality for students. And finally, even if you have a good environment, and even if, students, if teachers are empowered and have built skills around this, if they don't have the right tools, they can't do the work. And so we need to equip teachers with the tools they need in order to create these types of learning experiences, and we need students to be equipped with the tools they need in order to drive their own learning. And so, um, this is exactly what we set out to do with the Summit Learning Platform, a platform that allows teachers to curate incredible experiences, leverage data to intervene and mentor and coach, and um, analyze that data so that they can create um, new approaches in different directions and coach their kids. That's what the tool is designed to do. So let me tell you what this actually looks like in practice when you put it all together from a parent perspective. It turns out that my son, uh, who is 14 years old, is, goes to one of our schools and has been there for four years. And so this past fall, um, I, I got a call to go to a conference, an international conference, and they said, you know, we're really focused on kids, so can you bring a student with you? And um, I'm pretty, uh, uh, you know, most people wouldn't call me risk averse, but I wasn't about to bring someone else's child to Bulgaria with me. And so I said, um, you know, I'm happy to bring my own. He's actually a summit kid. And so they said, great, do that. About three weeks before the conference, I get another call and they say to me, you know, we had really wanted Todd Rose to come and present the end of average and the concepts in the end of average around individuality, but he can't come. But we were thinking it would be even better if a student could present those ideas. Do you think your son could, could prepare a 10 minute TED talk for the conference? <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, in that moment, I did not have my educator hat on. I had my parent hat on. And I was doing what I think most of us would do, which is running through my head, oh my gosh. He's going to have to read the book. He's going to have to understand all the concepts. He's going to have to write a speech. He's going to have to practice. I don't have time to do all of that. I'm traveling for the next three weeks. Fortunately, my educator brain took over in that moment and said out loud, well, that's not my choice. I'll have to ask him. I'll get back to you. So I check in with him that night, and I say to him, Rhett, you know, here's this opportunity. And if you're a parent, you may have seen this happen with your child at some point. He got that little smirky smile on his face that said to me, I've been waiting for you to ask me to do something like this, and immediately said yes. And I immediately started telling him all the reasons why he should probably say no. And he looked at me and he said, Mom, I got this. This is what we do every day at school. Remember, you made Summit. This is what we do. <laughs> All right. So I went on my merry way, and um, about three days before we're scheduled to leave, I was in DC at a meeting, happened to be in the meeting with Todd Rose, and a Google Doc pops in, and it's from him. And it says, hey, Mom, thought you might like to see my speech. I'm practicing right now. It's going to be great. And so, with a very um, fluttering heart, I open the document and I start reading. I was an English teacher, I'm a pretty critical reader. Um, and I start thinking, oh, this is not so bad. Wow, he actually kind of got this. Huh, did he write this himself, I wonder? 
course, I saw all the comments from his teachers and his peers who'd been peer editing and things, so I did know he wrote it himself. I got a bit enough courage to send it over to Todd in the same room, and then I kept watching him to see if he was going to look at it and hitting refresh a bunch of times. And after a few minutes, a comment pops up from him, and it says, hey, Rhett, this is really good. It's really good. Can I help you? Would you like to borrow my slides? And oh, by the way, hurry up and graduate. We could really use you in the lab. That's what it looks like. And it makes me wonder, as I think about what it felt like in that moment to be a mom, what would it be like if every single child in our country could go to a school like the one Edgar and Rhett go to? And this is actually not a rhetorical question. I'd really love for you to take a second right now and just imagine our country if every single child went to a school like this. What would it be like? When I imagine that country, it's the country I want to raise my son in. It's the country, country I want to leave to future generations. The school that I wished I could have gone to, the school I wished I could have taught in, and the school that I do send my child to. So what's next? Well, um, it's great that we do this in our own schools, but I've always believed that charter schools are um, designed to be incubators of innovation, and we have an obligation to share those innovations with the rest of the education system. And so, yes. And so, um, for the past decade, we have had a very open approach to things. We've toured thousands of people. We've tried to be as honest as we could about what is hard and what's challenging and what didn't work and what did work. And we've tried to share. But when people come and ask, can we do this, it is really difficult despite your best intentions. And we found ourselves sort of emailing around some PDFs and really not making much of a dent. Um, but fortunately, we live where we live in Silicon Valley, and we have access to people who think about how you can actually scale this in different ways than the way we traditionally think about it in schools. And so we were able to um, team with one of the most amazing engineering teams in the world and build this Summit Learning Platform. Um, and that platform contains our curriculum and assessment. We've been able to put training and support around that and offer for free um, to any school in the country who wants it the ability to have this set of tools and to do Summit Learning to offer these types of schools. And so two years ago, we worked with 19 schools and about 2,500 students um, in 10 states across the country to bring Summit Learning to their communities. This year, we've been working with 132 schools in 27 states and about 20,000 students doing the same thing. And I'd love to share with you um, one story of one of our phenomenal partners. Um, and this is uh, the, the group in Pasadena, Texas. Um, they visited us for several years before the Summit Learning Platform was available and always asked, how can we do this? How can we do this? We have a vision that we want all of our kids to be equipped for the future, and we need your help. We need your tools in order to make that possible. And so um, in the first year, three of their students, three of their schools joined us in partnership. And next year, we'll have 23 of the schools in Pasadena, Texas, working with us um, and partnering with us to make Summit Learning better. So um, this fall, we will actually launch um, several hundred more schools in the Summit Learning platform. They are incredibly diverse. They represent suburban, urban, rural, and every possible population of student that you can imagine. But they are committed and united by one common thing, and that is we are all deeply passionate about ensuring that every single student in this country has the opportunity to um, add an education that equips them for the life that they want to lead. 
And so as I wrap up here today, um, I want to ask you, as you think about um, whatever it is that you're working on, whether it be an investment or an assessment of a tool you're going to use or a design you're going to make for your school, if you will think about the why behind it and the purpose. And if you will deeply consider that, um, because I don't want us to lose track of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I will come back to where I started, which is um, unless uh, we know that why and why we want to change public, public education, we are never going to get the how right. And so, um, I am often called the crazy lady in the room, which is fine because I am a little crazy. Um, crazy in the same way that uh, when I was in third grade, I was not clean. And that is, the difference is today I have a voice. And so what I'd like to ask all of you to do with that voice is to be just crazy enough to join me in doing what it takes to create the schools that all of our kids deserve. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Krishna Vadati. What an inspiration that was, uh, last uh, presentation. Good afternoon, my, it's my pleasure to introduce you, um, your next speaker, Dr. Andrew Ng. Dr. Andrew, as many of you know, is, uh, chief, was the ch chief scientist at Baidu, he was co-founder of Coursera as an adjunct professor at Stanford University. He's going to give us an amazing talk on artificial intelligence in the next few minutes. At Baidu, he led a team of 1,300 uh, people that done many innovations in AI to their business units. And Andrew also uh, led the development of Stanford's MOOC platform and, and taught a course uh, on machine learning that had 100,000 students. Um, and uh, at Andrew also co -found, uh, founded uh, Google Brain Project. Uh, if you have not, it's a deep, uh, le deep learning neural, uh, artificial um, uh, neural network platform. And one of its main uh, great accomplishments is uh, they were able to uh, train a neural network just to watch YouTube videos and detect high-level concepts such as cats, 
um, without having to teach it what a cat is. Um, so uh, he's co-authored hundreds of papers, or authored some of those, and co-authored more than 100 papers, taught AI at Stanford for 10 years. Um, he's currently, um, his current mission is to kind of help uh, AI researchers worldwide uh, to take the drudgery out of human, such as self-driving or driving traffic. More importantly, um, critically take AI into areas such as healthcare. Um, Andrew is going to talk about why AI is the new electricity. It's going to be an amazing talk. Without uh, further ado, here is Dr. Andrew. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so after uh, Deborah and Michael invited me to speak here, I spent some time thinking what I thought would be the most useful things for you to know about AI. And so what I thought I'd do is share with you um, some thoughts on what AI can do for you today. Um, chat a bit about why AI is suddenly taking off in a way that it hasn't you know, for the last several decades. Uh, do a deep dive into one piece of AI technology uh, called neural networks or deep learning and then chat a bit about ethical issues, jobs, and you. Um, and before I get started, let me just, just to calibrate, um, I'm curious, if you raise your hand, how many of you, you know, prior to this conference had heard of artificial intelligence before? Right, cool, awesome, almost everyone. How many of you, uh, even prior to this conference, had heard of either neural networks or deep learning? Oh, wow, that's a lot of you, okay, awesome. Um, so, I've been making this analogy that AI is the new electricity. You know, about 100 years ago, we didn't have much electricity. It wasn't a commonly available thing. But started about 100 years ago, uh, electricity started to revolutionize every major industry. Our transportation, agriculture, manufacturing, communications were all revolutionized by the rise of, by the electrification of the United States and other countries. And I think AI is similarly poised to revolutionize industry after industry, including education, but also many others. Um, despite all the hype and buzz and excitement about AI, it turns out that as of today, almost all the economic value created by AI, which is tremendous, uh, almost all the economic value is due to one idea, um, and that's called supervised learning. But what that means is most of AI today is learning um, what I'm going to call input to response mappings. Um, so as an example, you know, maybe you want a piece of AI to input a piece of email and tell you, is this spam or not? You know, uh, zero or one, right? Uh, so that's a spam filter. Or maybe you want to input an image and have it tell you what object is this? And maybe there are a thousand objects you check. Right? You know, is this a cat? Is it a dog? Is it your friend? So maybe I'll put a number from one to a thousand. That's object recognition, or computer vision object recognition. Or maybe you wanted to input an audio clip and have it output the um, transcript. That's speech recognition. Um, and actually today, you know, uh, Google and Baidu, right, both companies where I've led AI teams, over 10% of the, uh, well over 10% of the uh, search traffic through mobile comes through voice, so you know, really growing adoption of speech recognition. Um, or input an English sentence and output a French sentence. That's machine translation. Um, or input an image. Uh, if you have a camera mounted facing outside in a car, uh, input an image and your radar returns and output the position of other cars. Um, and this is a key component of today's self-driving cars, right? Input a picture and the radar, tell you where the cars are around you. So the simple idea, learning input to response mappings, we call the input A and call the response B. But learning these A to B mappings, by fitting this in clever ways in different products or different business processes, this is transforming multiple industries. Uh, probably the single most lucrative application of this is inputting some information about the user and an ad, that's A, and try to predict will the user click on this ad or not. This is used to power advertising and show you the most relevant ads when you visit various web properties. And this might be the single most lucrative application of AI today. Um, and all this is, uh, and, and this idea of learning input to response mappings is called supervised learning, right? It's the technical term. Um, and 
you know, what can supervised learning do, right? Maybe here's one rule of thumb uh, that might help. You know, anything that a typical person, that say a typical human uh, can do with less than a second of thought, right? We can probably now or um, we can probably either now or the near future uh, automate, right, using AI. Um, and, you know, at maybe it was leading Baidu's uh, AI group. Uh, I've stepped away from a role there now. A lot of product managers are asking me, well, what can we do with AI? And I found that this was a useful rule of thumb to give them. So I actually had a lot of product managers running around looking for tasks that they themselves could do in less than a second and trying to automate those actually create a lot of value. But, but, and, and it turns out that a lot of business processes are taking a lot of one second tasks or sub one second tasks and stringing them together. So this could be a useful rule for somebody to spot automation opportunities as well. And um, I deliberately started off with some non-education examples, with some education examples, you know, um, input a quiz answer, right? And uh, I'll put a grade, you know, maybe zero to 100 or something. Or, or, or zero or one, is it correct or not? Or um, input an audio clip and output, um, you know, was this pronounced correctly? Right? Yes, there's a ton of CEO of Liu Li Shuo, a company out of China, uh, and the US is Elsa. Various companies using this to help people learn language. Um, or output a, face, uh, a facial picture, right? And um, tell you, is this the correct person? Right? So again, this is taking off faster in China than the United States, but using a picture of your face to identify the, verify the identity of a test taker uh, uh, you know, is, is also increasingly done using this type of learning A to B mapping, using supervised learning. Um, now, the idea of supervised learning has been around for many, many decades, and depending on how broadly you want to interpret a to B mappings and supervised learning, maybe around for several centuries. Um, but AI has been taking off today in a way that feels different than their previous several decades. So why is AI suddenly taking off today? Uh, when friends ask me that picture, there's a picture I draw to explain to them. And um, I would say, if you remember just one thing from this presentation, maybe just remember this picture I'm about to draw. Um, I would say that the primary reason that AI is taking off um, is scale. And let me explain that with a picture. So if on the horizontal axis, I draw, um, I plot the amount of data you have for a problem. And on the vertical axis, we plot the performance. Right? It turns out that for most traditional AI algorithms, traditional learning algorithms, the performance maybe kind of goes like this. Right? So the older generations of AI algorithms. And it was only in the last several years, you know, maybe starting about 10 years ago, and then it really took off starting about five years ago, we, we, we started to build neural networks. I'll say what a neural network is in a second. Um, so that if you build a you know, small neural network, um, its performance maybe looks like that. If you build a medium-sized neural network, and I'm using NN to abbreviate neural network, then its performance gets a little bit better. And is if you build a very large neural network, uh, that the performance kind of, you know, looks like it keeps going up and up and up. And so what this means is that for modern AI to work really well, to be really up here in the performance, you need, first, you need a very large neural network. Uh, this is why, actually, this is why I decided to build the Google Brain team. I thought I could use Google's cloud to build really large neural networks. And then more recently, uh, building HPC high-performance computers, the supercomputers that build really, really large neural networks. Um, but so you need a really large neural network and a lot of data if you want to build you know, the most effective neural networks. And I would say that over the last decade, a lot of a society 
because of the digitization of society, right? Digital activities on your cell phone or your laptop leave a digital trace. So over the last really 20 years, we've been creating more and more data, but it's only in the last maybe five years that our ability to exploit this data has accelerated with, uh, uh, with really scaling up these neural networks. Now, um, what is a neural network? And when I say data, um, you know, what, what, what type of data do I really mean? It turns out that supervised learning has one weakness, kind of one Achilles heel, which is that, um, as kind of implied by the picture on the left, it needs a lot of data. And what I mean is that uh, it needs a lot of um, data with both A and B, with both the input you want and the response that you want. Um, and what a neural network does, well, so what is a neural network? And I think, you know, because there's been so much mystique, so much hype about AI, I thought I'd actually do an a unusually deep dive on what is a neural network, so that if someone asks you what is AI hype, that you can actually give them a you know, concise answer about what is a neural network and what it can do and what it cannot do. But uh, what is a neural network? Well, let's take the simplest supervised learning problem of uh, predicting housing prices. Let's say on the x-axis, I tell you the size of a house in square feet, and on the vertical axis, I tell you the price of a house, right? So, you know, you might have a data set that looks like this, where bigger houses tend to be more expensive, and so you might fit a straight line to this, um, or you might say, well, prices can never be negative, so, you know, you fit a, like a function that looks like this. So this is a very simple neural network, right? And, and you draw this neural network as saying that you're gonna build a um, neural network, neural networks make a new, loose analogy to the human brain, right? But so you input the size of a house and output the price, and this little circle um, is an abstract diagram for a single, you know, simulated neuron, if you will. So this is like the simplest possible neural network. It turns out that this neural network that's creating so much value, product value, user value, uh, economic value, is taking this single neuron as if it was a small Lego break, and taking a lot of these Lego breaks and stacking them up to build much bigger neural networks. So for example, let's say you want to predict the size of a, uh, the price of a house, and you know the size of the house as well as the number of bedrooms. Then you might say, well, knowing the size and the number of bedrooms, that really tells me, you know, what's the family size, right, that can live in this house. And um, with the zip code, um, tells me, you know, how walkable is this neighborhood, right? And uh, if I know, you know, the wealth of the, 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 the area, well, since this is as UGSB, um, you know, let's have something about schools, I guess, something about school quality. And then it's really, when people are buying a house, they care a lot about, can this fit your family? Is it walkable? What's the school quality? And these things together, predict the price of a house, okay? So that's it, that's a neural network for predicting the price of a house. And a lot of the magic of a neural network is that given enough data about these inputs, that's A, and given enough data about prices, um, it can figure out this A to B mapping very, very accurately, way more than we could do you know, five years ago. This is working much better than before. And, and one, one technical detail, part of the magic of the neural network was that um, I described neural networks as you having to go in and figure out the family size, walkability, and school quality are the most important traits. Part of the magic of a neural network is if you give, give it enough data about A and B, it will figure this out. You know, it will figure out all of these things by itself, and you don't need to be the one to figure out what are the things it needs to model. Um, and whereas I've drawn a relatively small neural network there, today we routinely have you know, neural networks with you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of those simulated neurons. Um, and this has uh, been incredibly effective at learning to do a wide variety of tasks. So um, 
where are we in education? You know, I've seen AI enter a lot of industries. A very common pattern is that first comes the IT transformation, where more and more things become digital, um, and that creates data. And then first comes the IT wave, the IT transformation, and then comes the AI transformation, because the IT transformation creates all the digital data that AI can then come and eat to, 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 to create value. So um, some industries have been ahead of education. For example, online commerce, you know, selling stuff on Online. That just starts off online, or online advertising. That just has so much data online that AI is deeply embedded. Um, I think education, thanks to a lot of work of, of many of you, education is increasingly digital, and we are now at a phase where there is enough data, enough of it is in the digital realm, that there are a lot of opportunities for you to use AI to improve learners' experience or drive better economics or, or whatever your goals are. Um, and to, to give another example, you know, I think that uh, healthcare is another domain that AI is transforming with the Affordable Care Act, creating a lot more digital data, electronic health records, digitization, medical imaging, and I think a lot, lot, lot of it's often the IT way first and then the AI way. Right? It's a common pattern. Um, the AI transformation of companies and uh, uh, organizations is also creating new strategies. So let me give an example. This is what I call the uh, virtuous circle of AI, right? But a very common pattern for a lot of products is, um, you know, if you have a good, uh, uh, if you have a good product, right? Um, having a good product means that you can acquire a lot of users. A lot of people will use your product. Having a lot of users allows you to generate or to collect more data, and this data can be used via AI or supervised learning or some other type of AI to keep making improving your product and this creates a positive feedback group. And so this is one of the reasons why a lot of AI companies, a lot of AI businesses are able to keep making their products better and better because of this positive feedback loop. Um, and this is also one of the strategies for building a defensible business, right? Where, um, and so actually when I launch AI products, we've gone through very sophisticated planning exercises to think through data acquisition. And I've actually sometimes launched products where the main goal is, actually, is, is, is just to acquire data. So the, the strategies for data acquisition are increasingly sophisticated. Before I wrap up, I just want to mention something about um, ethics. The issue of ethical AI comes up a lot. So um, one, um, you know, I, I guess maybe Elon Musk most famously said that AI is summoning the demon. And I think there's a little bit of hype about uh, will AI take over the world, kill people. You know, my, my, my late grandmother, I think my grandmother loved me, but my late grandmother, I think she always secretly wondered if I was on the wrong side of the human versus you know, machine coming battles or something. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, in terms of fears about you know, evil AI killer robots, I, I think that worrying about AI evil killer robots today is a lot like worrying about overpopulation on the planet Mars. You know, I think that, I, I hope that hundreds of years from now we'll have colonized the planet Mars and maybe we're overpopulated. Maybe Mars will even be polluted and be all these children dying of pollution. And you could say, Andrew, don't you care about all these poor kids dying of Mars? And I would say, we haven't even landed on the planet yet. Um, and, and I think that uh, none of us see a clear path to, to the creation of evil AI killer robots. And I think that hype is actually quite unhealthy. Um, because almost all the value of AI today is learning A to B mappings, right? These tasks that humans can do in under a second, and uh, this, humans can do so much more. Having said that, I do think that in terms of ethics, there is a serious jobs displacement issue. For technical reasons, AI engineers and scientists are much better at automating things that people can do than at automating things that people cannot do. Um, so when you think of the near-term value of AI, don't think sentience, instead think automation on steroids. And um, for example, I've worked on several um, autonomous driving teams, self-driving cars. My wife is actually co-founder of uh, Drive.ai. But you know, autonomous cars are coming. And, uh, maybe 3.5 million truck drivers in the United States, jobs will be at risk. Um, or call center operators. Right? I've led teams that went into call centers, I've interviewed call center operators with really people on the phones, and as an AI insider, I know that I can automate a large fraction of their jobs. So these millions of people um, uh, in the United States and in many other countries working on call centers will happen to their jobs. And just this, and I've spoken to several chatbot organizations, right, just at GSV as well. Um, 
And this will affect blue collar and white collar workers, radiologists, right? Um, if you have a son or daughter uh, graduating from med school, maybe you know, think of doing radiology. Honestly, I think I wouldn't plan for a four year career in radiology. I think a, a five year or 10 year career in radiology, you know, that could work, but a 40 year career, I just don't see it, frankly. A lot of people don't see what's coming, the, the AI in, in, impact of automation on their jobs. Um, there have been a lot of reports on the jobs issue. Depending on who you ask, maybe 30% you know, to 50% of jobs right, might be at risk over the next, depending on which report you read, 15, 20, 25 years. But the flip side of this is if you take 100 minus this, maybe 70 to 50%, 100 minus this, right, of jobs may not be at significant risk. So I think, it's, so I think that um, we've, we've talked a lot about the skill gap issue. Um, and AI will accelerate this as an AI insider. I see so many jobs that square in crosshairs of you know, various AI teams. And it's already very clear that automation and AI will create tremendous wealth, will create tremendous value. But I think that if all of us want to create, I guess if all of us want to create not just a wealthy, wealthier society, but also a fairer society, then I think it's incumbent on all of us, on all of you, education specialists, to figure out how to deliver education to all the people that need it so that these people whose jobs are displaced can maybe take up some of these other jobs that are not yet at significant risk. Um, if you're in government, think about basic income or conditional basic income where you pay people to study. Uh, and if you're in education or university, think about how we could do something to help all these people so that everyone can, can continue to have a chance at a livelihood. So thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lubin Pampulov. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to announce the following two guests. One of them is one of the greatest sports commentators on American television, having been the voice for the US Open, Wimbledon, Roland Garros, and also having been the voice for the San Francisco 49ers, Ted Robinson. The other one is arguably one of the best tennis players of all times, having uh, been number one in the world for over 100 weeks and having won all four Grand Slam tournaments, putting him in a very small group of greats, including Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal, and uh, Rod Laver. In 1994, he started his foundation for education the Andre Agassi Foundation for Education, and has raised over $180 million since to help children at risk to get access to education. Please welcome Ted Robinson and Andre Agassi. Well, thank you all very much. 
for welcoming us. Uh, you can understand, I'm sure, all of you, what a thrill this is for me, because we all strive to do something once really well in our life, right? Can we really excel in one thing? How often do we get to be and hear from someone who has excelled in two fields, to be a great tennis champion, one of the greatest in his sport ever, and then to take that very same success and you said it to me outside, Andre, do something to help to do it with education. Well, sure, but uh, I tell you, one way to feel uh, not so accomplished is to marry somebody way better than you. So, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I thought, it was, uh, yeah. I thought I did a pretty good job out there, and then I met my wife, and, well, I don't bring my trophies home because she brings her home, and it doesn't, doesn't work out well for me at that point. <laughs> uh, but tennis did lead to uh, my life's mission and purpose, unquestionably. It is. And, and we will do that. We will talk an awful lot about what Andre has done. If you're not familiar, it's an extraordinary story. It's branched into new areas in the last couple of years that we'll hear about. Uh, one thing that I, I've heard this from the great champions like yourself that I've had the chance to work with in tennis through the years, the essential nature of this sport is problem solving. You're on the court and you're by yourself. Right? And boxing, even, we, we analogize a lot to boxing, but boxing, they go back in the, uh, at the end of a round or a corner, and you get somebody whispering in your ear. You don't have that in tennis. You figure out how to solve problems by yourself in the middle of a match. Yeah. And you've done the same thing, you've taken that to education, haven't you? Well, no, no question. I mean, tennis is that, uh, and it is different than boxing, because boxing, you not only are able to talk to your corner men, right, but you can actually feel and probably smell one another. In tennis, you're separated you know, by, you know, 80 feet across a net, and what I do affects what you do, and I think the one thing every champion or every player that succeeds at tennis ends up learning is you don't have to be good at it, right? You just, you just have to figure out how to be better than, than one person, and, and if you can do that over and over again, then sure enough, you're going to be, you're going to be pretty darn good, and so that is problem solving, you know, of its finest. Your, your opponent is a faceless opponent with strengths and weaknesses, and you, you have to be objective about your own, which I think carries over into, in, into life, but building teams around you that, uh, that can help, uh, you know, help you be more of who it is that, that, that you want to be. And you needed that on the court leading into a match, but in life you need that around. It's a privilege to be uh, here, uh, quite frankly, in the room with all of you, you know, watching so many people care about the future of our, our country. And uh, education to me has been my life mission. Uh, you know, I met with, um, many educators since I've been here. I've met with uh, uh, investors since I've been here. I've met with uh, innovators since I've been here. And all of you, you know, we all have the same goal in mind, which is how do we kind of leave, leave this world off a little better than, than we came into it. And, and I believe wholeheartedly that we can do that through education. So quite frankly, this room gives me hope that we can solve some of the daunting societal issues that do exist, you know, in our, in our country, whether it be medical or whether it be you know, education, it's something I've given my life to, and, and, I, and I, credit, I credit tennis for the platform and, and, and certainly for the experience <laughs> that made me uh, conclude that it is truly a crime to, to fail our future and not give them a future of their choosing. Mm -hmm. so, and so as we transform into that, I'm sitting here thinking your career, you, were, you played so well for so long, you ended your career playing against the players that are still going today at the top. You played Roger Federer, you played Rafa Nadal. But I can remember watching you and calling your matches when you're 18 years old and you have McEnroe or Lendl or Connors on the other side of the net. And let's face it, they're looking at you, especially a guy like Connors, he wants to rip your lungs out, right? <laughs> and, and you stood up and, and no, I mean, we, I'm serious. <laughs> I know Jimmy, he knows Jimmy. Um, but, but that's, you, you grew up in front of a world. I mean, it's astounding to be 18 years old, to have the eyes of the world on you, and you found a way to beat that guy who at the time was the older established champion. That's astonishing. Well, yeah, I mean, you, do, you definitely have to be uh, uh, blessed with a level of, of, of right, nature, born with, born with something, and then you need to be blessed with a uh, sort of a uh, psychotic dad who, who nurtures that <laughs> nature, right? So. Uh, I, I grew up a lot faster than I wanted to, and unfortunately I did that in, in front of many, of many of you. So at a time when I didn't know myself very well, I was being sort of told who I was. So that became the greater challenge and inside the lines, just trying to understand my connection to the game of tennis. It was, uh, you know, I don't want to spoil uh, 
the start of my uh, two and a half year uh, memoir that I wrote that took me two and a half years of my yeah. life, but I really did hate what I did for uh, most of my career. And, you know, I hated it for a lot of specific reasons. I saw what it did to my family, the way I was engaged with it, the pressures that were put on me in an early age, getting sent away from home to an academy when I was 13, to being in this uh, tennis academy where it was a bit like uh, Lord of the Flies with four hands. I mean, there was truly no, uh, no adult supervision, teenagers raising themselves. Your pecking order in life was about how you, how you performed on the tennis court. And so your barometer for who you are and, and what you aren't was defined by the tennis court. And, and I took that, 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 that stage of my life and started to rebel quite, quite heavily, feeling that an abandonment of sorts. And, and I took that rebellion right onto the world stage. So when I stepped out there against Connors, you know, I, I didn't know who I was. I was 18 years old in front of, tw you know, 23,000 people in New York who loved him and called me a punk, you know. And at the, at the end of the day, hopefully, um, hopefully they've reversed that a little bit. <laughs> but in, in, in any case, I, I let it fly from a tennis perspective, but the hard part was keeping that balance with, with truly growing up in front of the world. It's hard. For a lot of us of my generation, those of you that are my generation, because we think back to Andre and we think back to that ill, I, I know you're not thrilled with that campaign that came out, that image is everything. Because you sit here today and that's so wrong, right? It's all substance. Yet you had to live through that campaign. Well, I was complicit in it as well, right? So here I was, a young, young, young man who brought something new to a sport. I mean, I, I didn't like rules of any kind. And when tennis tells you you got to wear this and you got to do this and you got to do that, I just I completely did the opposite and felt good about it, continuing that sort of rebellion and, and you know, and getting offers to to do all sorts of things off the court. And one of which was Canon camera, and that's who you're referring to. And you know, while they make a great camera, they, you know, they don't do a lot for your own personal, uh, you know, image of sorts, I guess. But for a while, you know, they, I, I was literally was saying this line on camera almost like I was, uh, I didn't even know what was going on. I'm filming this commercial. It takes me two days to film all these different things. And all of a sudden, the commercial ends with this one shot that took me about 30 seconds to film. I was just thrilled the day was over. And that was the phrase, image is everything. And I'm going, image is everything, camera company, that all seems to line up. But had no idea that I'd get pinned with that as I would come so close to getting over the finish line and all these grand slams that you were a part of as well, Ted, and, and failing to do so. So I quickly was going down as one of the great underachievers of all time and uh, being associated with that sort of tagline didn't make it easier, let me put it that way. Yeah, and just a little bit, a couple more on tennis here. I, one of the greatest matches that I ever had a chance to commentate on, you were part of it, and the ending didn't work for you but it was about four nights before 9-11 at the US Open. You played Pete Sampras in Arthur Ashe Stadium, which is 22 or 23,000 23, seats, I believe. The match is four sets, all of them ended tie breaks. It was virtually flawless tennis by both men. And before the fourth set tie break, and I've never seen this moment ever, 23,000 people stood and applauded. And I remember on the air saying, this is, this is 23,000 people saying thank you to the two of you before the match was finished. Yeah. In the heat of moments, does that register with you? Uh, you know, there are very rare moments when you're in a zone where, where something like that registers. Uh, unfortunately, so many things registered over the years when you weren't in a zone. I was, unfortunately, the ball was the only thing I wasn't focused on and, and you're focused on a lot of other stuff. In that particular case, I'd never had a situation on a tennis court where everything was in focus and all of a sudden, 23,000 New Yorkers just said, I don't care what, you, what you're focused on. Um, you need to stop for a second and appreciate uh, what this has meant. And yeah, I remember the hair standing on the back of my neck yeah. and, and I looked across the court at Pete, one of the few times I actually liked him on a tennis court. And, <laughs> uh, and, and I, yeah. we kind of had a, we had an interesting moment too, you know, looking at each other almost as if, you know, hey, we've, you know, we've done this regardless what happens. Look, you know, anytime you can have this moment, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty special. But the only thing I got to say louder than 23,000 screaming, applauding, cheering New Yorkers is 23,000 silent New Yorkers. Because yeah. from the moment they were standing up applauding, they went from that to, okay, we're done. Now we want to pick up right where we left yeah. off. And <laughs> that, was right. that, that was kind of an odd feeling, tossing the ball up and, and, not, and you could hear a pin drop in the same stadium that a second earlier was, uh, your ears were ringing. Then there's one other moment I remember so vividly, and it ties into your, uh, to your 
Academy in Las Vegas. You, you use the word respect a great deal as part of the mission for all your students there. And, and I thought an incredible sign of respect was 2006 Wimbledon. And you played Rafa Nadal. Now Rafa Nadal at the time was I think 20, but he'd already won a couple of French Opens. People knew how good this young guy was. But here's Andre, you'd announced it was your last Wimbledon. And Rafa Nadal beats you. And at the end of the match, he went and sat down. And you stood up at center court and received the deserved ovation from center court. And I always have respected Nadal so much for that, for understanding to have the respect of that moment. Do you remember any matches I won? Or <laughs> <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I mean, I, I did have a few of them. Yeah. You know, but, uh, I, I, I tell you, uh, uh, watching that next generation, I was blessed to really be able to play through a lot of generations, as you, as you alluded to, Ted. And, and, and I think one of the greatest uh, joys I have in, in, in the context of my ent entire career, second to going to number one, falling to 140 in the world, and then at 29 going back to number one a second time and winning more at the age of 30 and above than I did leading up to 30, separate from the pride I take in what I learned through that journey, was being able to play in the generation that we see now, watching the likes of Nadal, Federer, Djokovic, you know, Murray I got to practice with, Djokovic I got to play an exhibition against once. You know, you look at these guys because they're not only such professionals, they're not only such great athletes, they're not only so good and make the game look so easy, they not only do things that we never did, um, but they do it with a great deal of respect for not just the sport, but also for one another, you know. Um, they do it with a great deal of respect to the fans. I've never seen Rafa, as you mentioned him, never have time for a fan as he's walking off the court. I've seen him on the practice court where sometimes he's spent more time after his practice court just, just taking care of the fans and the kids and signing. I've never seen him not show respect to the, to, to the media who was asking him who wanted their time. He understood that it was important to the game and always gave time and, and to the opponents. And, and I watch it now and uh, many times I just, with the way I lived and as competitive as I was and the lack of sort of uh, context that I had in my own life, I always thought people that did that were uh, quite frankly just bullshitting. You know, it's like, <laughs> well, it was like, you know, okay, you don't really mean this. You're just playing like mind games with me right now because I'm miserable, I don't want to be here but you're acting like this, you'd rather be nowhere else, so I put on the same charade, but these guys really do have a healthy context. Novak is an example, Djokovic waking up and, and brushing the court off of shrapnel, you know, from, from bombs dropping, you know, where, where he grew up, just so that he could practice. Talk about, talk about people that have a context for, for life, so I have a great deal of respect, and, and you're right, I look back in the doll of fond memories, one of which is certainly that one. Yeah. Uh, so we'll Talk about the moment. There, it's been about 20 years since your foundation started. Am I right? Was it the late 90s? Uh, it was early 90s yeah. my foundation started. It led into education towards the late 90s. Yeah. And by the way, if you haven't read Andre's memoir, Open, it's the most appropriate title, by the way, for a memoir that I've ever come across. It's spectacular. And just a couple of lines I pulled out from it. Uh, you wrote, I didn't transform. You, critical of a lot of media people like us who would say, what a transformation. You said, I didn't transform, I formed. I thought that was a great line. When did that, and was there a lightning bolt moment when you're playing tennis and winning championships where you said, education is my passion? There was a, there was a moment, but uh, I tell you, the reason why I say I didn't transform, I formed is because I have this uh, belief, uh, quite frankly, that we're all in process. And I think it took me far too long to realize that. I don't care what you've accomplished or what you haven't accomplished, who you are, who you wish you'd be, um, what you think you are, what you're not. Uh, this is all parts of this journey that we go through, this thing called life. And we're constantly in process. And thinking about it any other way is, 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 is a, not, it's a disjustice. And it limits, it limits who you are and, 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 and what you're meant to accomplish in this world. And, and that's the one thing that occurred to me through my book is just mm -hmm. how I am, I'm literally in process. And, and tennis teaches you that because you have to learn from your failures and, your, and, and your, uh, your successes. But I got into education because I was hit with this harsh reality that I didn't have choice in my life. 
I, I was introduced as the future number one tennis player in the world from the time I could walk, and that's all I remember, and it's what I had to do. And then I got sent away, and pretty soon it became the only thing I could do, because education wasn't, wasn't a choice. And I resented all of it, and I thought winning was going to be the answer. So I, I did that. I won. I got to number one in the world, and, and I still felt that disconnect, so much so that I was willing to go on a two-year self-infliction um, process in my life that took me to, to rock bottom in more ways than we have time to even talk about today. But I remember at my lowest point, I was in Germany. I was with my coach, Brad Gilbert, who you know so well. And he's a real simple kind of guy. And he was able to rein in my, my, uh, my emotional uh, roller coasters and get me to focus on just one thing at a time. And then he was even struggling to do that. So he followed me into my hotel room after a first round loss where I'd lost more matches than I had won that year, 140 in the world. And he locked the door and opened up a beer and said, we're going to quit or we're going to start over, but that's the choice that's being made tonight. And, and I'm not going to accept anything otherwise. And I remember never hating tennis so much as I did in that moment, looking out the window, seeing so many people in the traffic going in and out to the courts, back, this way, that way. And I remember asking myself, what do these people do and why do they do it? You know, and that was, a, that was a real pivotal moment for me because it occurred to me how little we all choose in our life. I mean, we all can sit here and say, well, I'm here because I chose this, but we didn't choose where we were born. We didn't choose how we were nurtured. We didn't choose what strengths or weaknesses we have. We, we, we don't have the luxury of doing any of that, but that doesn't mean we can't take ownership of what we do have and can't find ways to connect with the life that we're living. And, and so at that moment, I made it my passion to find my reason. I, it's like I gave myself commit, uh, the ability to quit, and then I rebelled against myself and said, well, no, I'm not going to quit because it's not that easy. I'm going to find my reason. And, and it took me a while to find it. Epiphanies for the record, don't change your life. I'll never suggest they do. But what you do with that epiphany on a daily basis has a profound impact on your life. And I remember watching a show on 60 Minutes, Michael Feinberg, Dave Levin, who I'll celebrate the rest of my life because of their impact on me with the KIPP program, Knowledge is Power. And, and I watched them roll up their sleeves, changing these kids' lives. And the one thing you recognize in them doing that is that they're creating real systemic change for children that have no choice in their life, except the difference between them not having choice and me not having choice is, you know, they don't have the luxury of, uh, of their lack of choice bitching about being the best, the best athlete in any given sport in the world. You know, you're talking about having a cycle of activity in their family. And so literally overnight, I took out a $40 million mortgage. I mean, call it like it is. I took out a $40 million mortgage. I got my charter license in the fifth largest school district of America, and I took a shovel into a, in, into a, a, a desert, uh, and I hit Caliche at the same time. So I took another few million dollar mortgage, knowing we have to get through the Caliche under the ground. And my goal was to prove that we're failing kids, they're not failing us. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, tennis became the reason for what, for, for what my real mission was. And all of a sudden, I got out of my own way, and, and I started this process. And I can go through the, the inspirations and motivations of what I went through as an athlete and, and as a person. but. What I can tell you, it was absolutely the impetus to start this journey in the educational space. And then that's what led me. You know, I, built, I started my school in third grade because you know, I heard reaching a kid in third grade is like a two minute drill in football. You, know, you can march the field, you can score, but reaching them in fourth grade is like a Hail Mary in the end zone. You're, 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 you're gonna barely reach any of them. So I started in third grade and within two years said, what am I doing? You know, I mean, the remediation process here is is overwhelming. We need to go back and do K. You know, we got to start earlier. You know, if it's up to me, I'd be waiting outside the delivery room, right? So, <laughs> but we have the we, we have the. I mean, we all share the same passion. But we have the we have we have the fifth largest school district in America, 330,000 kids. We're 50th in the in the country in kids we put into college. So, you, you know, fast forward a, a handful of years, our academy has graduated close to you know in the high 90s. I'll never I'll never be at 100% because I, I just. I'm too tempted to take risk on children that society is so quick to write off. But at the end of the day, we've graduated you know, to the high 90th percentile of kids we, we, we put into college. And I don't know, I, just, I do thank tennis for that, no question about it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you touched, I think, on a very salient point there in that Nevada, your home state, hasn't spent on education what you'd like it to. And you've backed up your commitment with money. 
It's true, but uh, listen, we're, 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 we're sort of uh, preaching, if you will, to a yeah. wide, wide audience here, and some of, with, some of which are, are heavily involved in the, in the financial side and recognize mm -hmm. that the scalability and sustainability of something is not just throwing resources, right? Resources without accountability is a real, is a real problem. It creates entitlement, it creates dependency, and it, it, it undermines the very fabric of of what it is you're trying to instill in these children, which is you can do this, you know, for yourself and of yourself, you know. So yes, it's a broken educational system. It's why we're here. It's why we need to innovate. Mm -hmm. It's why we need to do things. To, to give an example of of my part in the process through building this K through 12 for 1,200 kids, I raised about I don't know 185 million more or less of philanthropic dollars. Well, 1,200 kids on an annual basis. That's quite. That's, that's quite a, a good thing. 3,000 kids on the waiting list. So I'm sitting here going, you know, in the world I come from, that, makes, that means I'm twice the failure, I'm in success. That's great, we have 1,200 kids in here, but we got 3,000 on the waiting list. And by the way, if we took those 3,000 in, we're not gonna have room for, 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 for the next line of kids. So I started to think to myself at an early, pro, an early part of this process, what's the real scalability of this? I mean, what, what is it, can we do it through legislation? Can we do it through you know, private funding? What's the way to do it? And, and the good news was, is I recognized I'm not an operator and I'm not an educator. I'm not like, you know, many of you here. I, 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 I'm an eighth grade dropout, you know, but what I recognize I am is a facilitator. I was able to take this dream, raise a lot of awareness, a lot of resources, and make this dream a reality in the fabric of these kids' lives. So as I looked at what the problem was with scaling best-in-class charter schools, you know, and, 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 and I'm not a proponent of just charter schools. I'm, I'm a proponent of anybody that knows how to educate our future. And by the way, the 85% of charter schools don't because they're a mom and pop shop just like me, frustrated, unable to out earn their failures. And, and, and I'm not interested in scaling me mediocrity. So how do you scale this footprint for those that have a proven track record of being able to educate our future? And me, not being an educator operator, was able to recognize that the impediment to their growth is is not the software, right? It's not the it's not the kids. It's it's you know the technology is always improving. There's always ways of scale to the to the growth of these classrooms, but it's actually the hardware. They can't access public dollars for their facility. So as a result of not being able to access public dollars for their facility, so for their for their facility, they get their charter's license. If a kid follows it. Uh, follows, uh, the money will follow a kid to that charter, and now all of a sudden that school has the ability over a period of time to incubate church basements, boys and girls club, and, 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 and scale. So I'm saying, well, geez, isn't this really an infrastructure issue? It, I mean, what if we could come and to the table with, with the capital to actually build the facility, actually give the infrastructure, and relieve the overcrowded school districts where when kids leave, they're going to an environment where they're gonna learn, it helps them. And by the way, it's not costing taxpayers anything. So that money falls to the state, so you can build a $10 million facility. You have 800 kids in a state with 10,000 per student. That's $8 million of revenue on day one with a, with a built-in wait list, right? So I'm going, wait a minute, there's an economic model to be had here. I partnered with Bobby Turner out of Southern California who came into my life at such a blessed time and we sat together and hammered out this business model. How can we no longer count on philanthropy to scale? Because guess what? Philanthropy ends when philanthropists run out of money or when philanthropists change their focus of what they want to do. And, and how long are we sit around and wait for the government to do this? They've already proven that, that it's, it, it needs to be changed. It's like, it's like having the fire department fight fires three days a week. It's like, well, what if my house burns mm -hmm. on that other day? Am I even, am I, am I covered? So we can't do it, but we can still innovate in this country, which is one of the reasons why we're all here. We went to the private sector and sold a business model that simply said, don't give us your money, invest your money. Guess what we're gonna go do? We're gonna go build a school for somebody that knows how to educate. And guess what? We're not gonna play landlord because nobody gets rich in the tenant-landlord relationship except the landlord. We're gonna take that and we're gonna redirect it and flow for you a, a, through the tax and bond market an ability to purchase back this facility for a number that satisfies a like-minded investor. An investor that says, I realize we have daunting societal issues, but I also I'm not gonna give away my money and, and, and I, I, I don't wanna do that. So if we can create what I call that realist, that person who's willing to give their money as an investment with a return that satisfies them to know that it's actually scalable and sustainable. And the operators have loved it. So it took me 
14 years, and I'll stop being so long-winded. It took me 14 years to build one school in Clark County in the most economically challenged area for 1,300 kids. In the last four years, we have built over 70 schools, deployed over 650 million, and by the way, have close to about a billion more to spend currently to, to, to help facilitate the growth for those who know how to educate our future. So as a result, we all need times like this where we can come together, put our minds together, put our ideas together, and really figure out sustainable solutions. That's amazing. So that I, one I, school, go ahead. No, sorry, I want to add this too, because when I was selling this damn thing, right? <laughs> right I'm going, okay, I, I, found, I, found, I found the Chinese to be the most sophisticated in, this, in the early part of this process. And let me tell you why. So I'm selling this fund, it was, I was meeting with, from the CIC, China Investment Corp, and, and I'm walking through the merits of this investment. I'm walking through the mitigations of risk that are in place. And, and they're in. They're, they're going to invest. And, and those of you that don't know me, and you know, my book will disclose that, which is I have a real thirst for knowledge, and I'm not scared to ask dumb questions. This is one of these times where I just stepped up and I asked a dumb question. I said, why is China interested in investing in a real estate infrastructure fund focused on education in America. And then I went, why did I just ask that? They said they were investing. And, and yes. he looks at me and he says, with all due respect, Mr. Agassi, you are indebted to our country to the tune of almost $2 trillion. There is nobody at this table that's going to be alive to pay that back. We are relying on you and your country to educate your future so that your children's children can pay us back and you're failing <laughs> and you're failing to educate your children so this is a hedge against the bet we've already made in you. Mm -hmm. I I looked at him and I said did you say with all due respect or with all disrespect? I don't, I, but, but, you know, I, I, it, but it's true. We're, you know, we, are, we have been too slow to getting ahead of this curve uh, on multiple ends. And that's why I'm thrilled to be here as, as a giant effort from all of us in our lives to make time for things that you never know where it's going to lead. So um, it, it, this, is, this really gives me a lot of hope. Dumb questions, by the way. You'd be a hell of a sportscaster. <laughs> but they generally breed smart answers. That's the good thing, like you just got. Um, so that is an extraordinary accomplishment. Where are the schools that you have now built? Oh, we're everywhere. We're, you know, from Florida to New York to uh, Philadelphia, all throughout Texas, Tennessee, one race to the top dollars with Arne Duncan, uh, race to the top funds uh, to Arizona, California, Nevada. Um, you know, we're probably in about 19 different marketplaces. Uh, you know, the, the metrics to the, the metrics to quite frankly are are real estate value versus per pupil allocation. And you know, the only place it doesn't the model doesn't really work is where there's high real estate and low per pupil. So it, we'll never build a school in San Francisco or probably you know heart of Los Angeles because of because of real estate and per pupil allocations. But with that being said, um, it works in many other many other uh, uh, ways. And 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 that we're not done there. That's the infrastructure. We still got to facilitate for these operators technologies that allow them to be very efficient with how they educate these kids, mm -hmm. and and that's where I'm I'm like mine. I mean, well, we got educators here, we got you know innovators here, we got investors here, and I'll raise my hand to two and a half of those. I don't know if I'm an educator. I mean, I I, I, I learn a lot more than I teach. I, I assure you that. But I'm 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 definitely one that wants to look at it outside the box and has figured out a small way to do it. And I'm definitely an investor. I've put my money behind uh, very few things, uh, but not just my money, also my time. And, and one of the things that I've done that's relevant here at this, at, at this conference is, is Square Panda. And I encourage every one of you to look at it. It's early childhood learning, teaching literacy, how to read and how to do it sustainably, how to do it efficiently, how to do it in classrooms, how to do it indiv individually. Uh, we have a booth out here. We are, uh, again, China is leading the way, which I respect as it relates to the impact of this. It's a tablet accessory. It's tactile. 
It's, it's, it's software driven to the 95th percentile and it can be scaled all across this country and all across school districts. I did case studies with this in my own school. I saw the difference of how fast kids can learn with this versus without. The impact of this has, has dyslexia, uh, reading uh, implications, you know, flagging that at an early age. We all know how important that it is. Language implications. It has seared reading, technological uh, advancement. It, to what it does to these kids' lives, I saw it. And when I saw it, I, I put my own money up, but I did something that was even more, you know, remarkable than that. Yeah. I gave my time and my energy to it. I'm so proud, and, and Brand, I'm so proud of what it's doing right now that all of you need to hear it, you need to be aware of it, and you need to go kick the tires, and you need to figure it out because I've already gone through that process, and we're at, we're at our infancy, and it's going to have a, a huge impact as all of us need to come to this, you know, come to this table and, and, and take our appropriate seat to, to solve for, for some of these issues. Yeah. That's great. What, what's the proudest moment? you've had in this education journey of yours for all these years, from, from Agassi Prep in Las Vegas through these charter schools, what's the proudest moment you've had? Uh, tomorrow. Yeah? Tomorrow. 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 I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know if it's the way I'm wired and maybe that's why tennis came a bit more intuitive to me from the standpoint of capacity for pain, um, but, or if it's what I did for my whole life that has taught me uh, you know, yesterday doesn't, doesn't matter. You know, if we, don't, if we don't live today right, our future doesn't matter either. So there's, there's something about living on the edge between where I am today and what needs to be done. And I'm most proud when I'm, when I'm living profoundly in that space. I mean, there, there's a reason why our front window is bigger than our rear view mirror in our car, right? I mean, right. Th wh where we're going is way more important. What's behind us is less important. But what matters right now is getting there. And so I, I kind of I live pushing. I, I mean, watching the first graduating class, I can point to moments, you know, on a tennis court. What's more powerful, winning a grand slam or, or deciding to recommit yourself to, to, to a sport that's been so good to you? I, you know, my, my greatest moment might have happened at my lowest moment sitting in that hotel room. So it's hard to answer that. Yeah. Would it be moving to have somebody from that first graduating class or second or third that comes to you someday and says, Andre, I want to help you. I want to help pay this forward because there'll be a time when you'll need that, right? Uh, yeah, well, helping me is less important than, than helping the cause, right? I mean, right. what we're trying to do. So I guess a real, a real interesting moment would be if one of them was sitting in this audience right now and goes, hey, you know, I mean, I figured out something smarter. You know, it's like, great, you know, I mean, I would love to see, I guess, I guess you could ask, well, what really defines success? I mean, defining success for me with my educational journey is watching these kids not just graduate, not just go to college. Some kids aren't meant for it. Some kids need vocational deals and some kids need to focus on, on other things, no question about it. But truly success in any case would be coming back to your community and changing that cycle of of, of activity, you know, breaking that downward spiral for, for, for the next generation. I mean, if, if we can create and instill that a bit like we do with alumni in some of our great universities, right? I mean, we ask them to come back. We ask them to, to open their, 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 their purses and their, and their, their offices and to, to those that have, we need to do that in our communities. And, and that's, that's what would be, would be success for me. All right, Roger Fetters. 35 and a half, and he's still winning. This is extraordinary. You watch, when you watch Federer, are you blown away by what he's doing now? Yeah, I think I'm gonna make a comeback. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I retired at 36. I yeah. played Roger at 35 and a half in the finals of the US Open, and uh, I have a full appreciation for what he's doing and certainly how easy he makes it look. So uh, uh, yeah, I, I marvel at him along with everybody else. No, oh, that's, that's amazing when you think that as you said, you had your greatest, probably you say your greatest run was in your 30s? Absolutely, I, was, I won more in my 30s than I did before. Right, yeah. right, and you look at what these people are doing today, they're stretching the, they're stretching the boundary of what tennis, the mortality rate, haven't they? Yeah, they're learning to invest in themselves, you know, which is a great thing to see, you know. Back when I played, we just played because we were worried about, 
you know, the next, the next ranking week or, or, you know, I was one of the first ones that sort of looked at it, uh, looked at my body as sort of, uh, uh, I had a use by date, I felt like, you know, attached to my body and I, I had to choose wisely and I wanted to extend that date and so I made sacrifices, I, I pulled out of tournaments, I trained during certain tournaments, you know, I played others but it was always about doing just what I needed to to keep getting better even through my 30s and, uh, you know, hopefully something's been learned by that. Certainly sounds like Roger, um, you know, in talking to him over the years, he, he kind of always uh, had a kind word to say to me about what I did, making him feel like he can do it. And I told him to set his bar higher than whatever I showed him because he's, uh, he's, he's headed into uncharted waters and yeah. he's proven it now. Well, to, if, if you're not a tennis fan, understand that even to this day, those of us that talk about tennis for a living measure anybody's return of serve against Andres. How does it measure up against Andres? Well, yeah, my, uh, a few of them are better, quite frankly. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of technicality to returning a serve. I, I had to return aggressively because of the way my body was structured, the way my game was built. Uh, some of these guys now can be just as offensive as I was, but they also have the ability to be incredibly defensive if they wanted to on the return. Their pockets are bigger. You know, the game's gotten better. I, I marvel at watching that that evolution. I I just was always I always took a lot of pride that if I got my racket on the ball, um, you were going to know it. <laughs> that's that's all. Well, I, there, there's a line in your in your book that I think is a wonderful way as we wind down here, this discussion of your devotion to education. And you wrote this, these are Andre's words. A boy who despised and feared school became a man inspired and re-energized by the sight of his own school being built. You wrote that in open about the vision of your academy in Las Vegas. That's incredibly moving. Yeah, it's incredible that academies would define my life on both ends of it, you know. And mm -hmm. My academy I got sent to that shaped my trajectory of my life and the academy I built, which has basically uh, changed the trajectory of my life uh, in a whole new direction. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, contradictions I think we all have to reconcile in our own life. I encourage everybody to do it uh, soulfully with themselves because when I came to terms with my contradictions, there were probably some clear, clear answers to it and profound, uh, profound sensibilities. And, and, you know, sharing that was just one of them. Well, it's, a, it's an honor again, a champion in tennis and in my life in sport, a long, long time being around a lot of great players. I've never seen anyone who's been able to take that same, those same skills and channel it into something even more worthy than education, a champion in education as well. So Andre, thank you for sharing all of that with us thank and you. allowing me this. Thank, thank you, you guys. Uh,